Welcome everyone to ULP's first leadership conversations for 2021. I think uh, the taking of the mask is not only symbolic, but it's to remind us of the non-pharmaceutical guidelines that we are asked to follow as a country. And uh, I assure you that with today's event as well, we've taken all the precautions required for today's event. Um, I always find it difficult to talk into a camera because I'm not a broadcaster by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, as they try to point me to the right uh, camera, they don't, 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 don't stress if you're on the other side. I'm going to get it right by the end of this uh, uh, chat. So today I welcome you to the first ULP leadership conversation. You know, it was very difficult for us to come up with a topic. Uh, but we also didn't want to be very presumptuous, so we didn't want to say the three wise men. And uh, when we started advertising this event, the wise became uh, a topic for the day, that we should have used it or shouldn't have used it. So for those who are watching, you will then, by the end of this event, define that are they wise or not. Uh, and no pressure on you, says. But uh, all I'm here to do is to welcome you and to also welcome our facilitator today. We're a special friend of the family and myself who's coming here to, uh, to be the, the facilitator and program director for us tonight. Uh, I have to say that uh, I went to a multiracial school, so when I married, I married my wife who was good at English uh, so that she could read for me. I don't have to read. Because in high school, every time there was unprepared reading, I just seemed to be sick. And I didn't do that. So as I read today, forgive me for the parts that you feel I'm not doing so well on, OK? Just understand that. But today, I want to introduce Bram Milton and Corsi. Uh, I'll keep calling him Bram Milton. And uh, you'll understand why at the end. But uh, Bram Milton and Corsi, uh, was with uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation Africa Bureau Analyst and Correspondent until uh, January 2020, when he retired after 30 years of service at the BBC. Pramilton is now the chairman of MMN International Consulting, which specializes in reputation, advisory, and media management. Pramilton spent four years as a as South Asia Bureau Editor based in New Delhi in India. He was in charge of the BBC News Bureau in the region's countries such as Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and of course, uh, India. Before then, Bramilton was head of Africa uh, as Bureau Chief in Johannesburg, a role that he held and served in for seven years. He joined the BBC in the 80s, just before Nelson Mandela was released from prison. He covered all the township wars at the time and subsequently the political negotiations that followed. Bramilton did his journalism training at the BBC Academy's College of Journalism in London. His management and leadership program from um, Ashridge College in Hertfordshire. He studied teaching and civil engineering, which is good, yeah. teaching. Over the years, Bramilton has covered major stories in Angola, the Zaire, in Zaire, which present-day uh, DRC, Sierra Leone, Libya, Rwanda, Kenya, Z Zimbabwe, Sudan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, and many other countries. And I, you know, one day we're going to have a ULP where he'll just be telling us stories from covering the wars in the Middle East. He's also an ex excellent storyteller, if I say, according to me anyways. But Milton has been fortunate uh, to interview many global leaders, and these are include but are not limited to uh, Walter Sisulu, Harry Lip Harry. Lafonte, some of you might not know who that is, but the people on the panel, I'm sure they definitely know. Former President Bill Clinton, former US President Bill Clinton, former UK Prime Ministers Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, FW de Klerk, 
former Nigerian President Obasanjo, former UN Secretary General, amazing guy, Kofi Annan, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, former President Jacob Zuma, President Tambombeki, and former Deputy President Khalima Mutlante, including our current President Cyril Ramaphosa and the late Winnie Mandela, amongst many. But Milton moved to work in the UK and returned to South Africa before moving to New Delhi. He was instrumental in the publishing of the book Soweto Inside. He's a Soweto boy. The one day we was in Soweto and I saw him walking down the road. Like, you couldn't even tell it's by Milton. He has also written a chapter in the world acclaimed book, something, something to write home about. These two books are sold all over the world and they've reached, they've, they are award-winning books. Uh, last week, funny enough, we launched our first uh, uh, UOP Authors Forum. So, Baba Khadeva, there's a candidate for you. He remains active after his retirement. Bar Milton is a, is a trustee on the board of Warwick uh, University's Africa Project and is a lecturer at the Institute for Advancement of Journalism. Last year, Bar Milton joined some of his BE colleagues to go around the the country helping teach storytelling, investigative journalism, solution journalism, and deep listening at four universities. These include NWU uh, in Mafikeng, UCT in Cape Town, Tekis in Pretoria, and UJ in Johannesburg. Dr. Mohali, apart from you with your association with UJ, the rest of the panelists must question themselves. Yeah. In December last year, he delivered a lecture at Namibia University of Science and Technology. In 2017, Bram Milton traveled to Dubai to interview Duduzani Zuma on allegations of state capture. This video has went viral all over social media and has over 1.2 million views on YouTube alone. You know, Bram Milton, if I'm gonna write you obituary, this is the one thing I'm gonna write. I think I'll conclude Everything. That's the one thing you, you're known for with all your acclaim achievements and everything you've done. But Milton is married to a, uh, to a new neurologist, but uh, the first part of it is pediatric neurologist, Dr. Dorcas Wilson. So I was fortunate to do a course with Bar Milton's wife. And because uh, we've got professors here, let me tell you a little bit of a story. Every time a new professor comes into class, they want to get the feel of the class. So because we're not a major class, they would ask everyone, what's your name, your background, and what you do? And I know we had someone who had a PhD guy in the class, we had Wittblin School, and we had quite a few people who had done very well. But every time it got to Dr. Dockers, and she says, I'm a pediatric neurologist, I would stand up and whistle and go, <laughs> Because there's, I mean, that title alone almost shuts all of us down. But she's a very lovely lady, and they were blessed with two kids, a 20-year-old, Josi Itzile, oh, that's Kisitswan, and uh, 18-year-old, uh, Kanyisile. Uh, Although Bar Milton is an award-winning journalist, he often reminds me and others that he just wants to be known as an ordinary township boy from Orlando West and in Soweto, who supports and loves Orlando Pirates. So I don't think we could have found anyone better fitted to be the, the facilitator today. So without any further ado, Bram Milton, over to you, my brother. Uh, Theo, that was uh, way above my pay grade. Um, thank you so much for your kindness. Uh, before we start, can we take off the mask? Uh, we are observing the uh, current status of affairs with COVID here and the government uh, mitigating regulatory framework. But for the viewers uh, on, uh, on the screen online, uh, particularly the deaf viewers, it's, uh, it's good for lip reading. So we're taking off the mask uh, for that. So please feel free to take off the mask. And there's enough social distancing. If you can see here, we are covered in that area. It's good to be back here. Um, we love this place. 
unleashing leadership potential. Uh, if you have time at home, uh, in the next few weeks and months, follow the program here and come here. It will inspire you. Uh, the topic for uh, tonight, uh, as uh, the CEO has quite rightly pointed out, there was a d debate about the wise in the sentence, the three wise men from the East. Well, um, this is a very poignant moment for South Africa. Sitting before us here are three men who were born in the east of Johannesburg and grew up in Katlehong. And today, they are all three of them uh, professors. And it is a very special moment, not just for Katlehong, for any person who, grow, who grows up from any township, any village, and from any corner of this world, to see you sitting here, and wherever you are in any township, look at these men here, and know that anything on this planet is possible, and it's not where you come from, it's where you are going. This is what this is about. There's an old quote which I lived by for many years, by the renowned author Oscar Wilde. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. This is what has happened here. So if you remember the story of the three wise men in the Bible, in the uh, good book of Matthew, you know that there were three kings who uh, visited uh, Jesus and saved him from the clutches of uh, the uh, King Herod. We are not trying to say these men are equal to those ones. But as I was preparing for tonight, I saw that they bore gifts for Jesus. And tonight, also, these three gentlemen from the East have a gift for South Africa. They have one gift, education. And I thought that was a nice little twist in the tale there uh, as I was preparing. Now, um, I will introduce uh, the professors. But uh, before I do that, I want it to be remiss of me, of course, not to congratulate uh, Babu Morris Khadeve, who was confirmed yesterday as the adjunct professor at Vets Business School. Congratulations. So it's very, it's very special. And um, I will come to his background in a minute. Let me start with my good old friend, Bonang. Uh, this is an amazing uh, human being, a professor Bonang Mohale. We've known each other for a few years now, and he knows that my wish is to reduce my size to his size. <laughs> and uh, uh, I always admire his uh, thought. And also, there's a small connection. When he started in his career, when he went to university, he studied medicine. So um, uh, we love that connection. Uh, and we've discussed it so many times. Um, as we sit here, uh, Professor Bonang Mohale is the Chancellor of the University of the Free State, for which we are incredibly proud. And he has an illustrious career, which I won't bore you with, because if I read you all his achievements, we will not be discussing anything else tonight, because he has achieved so much. He was former chairman of Shell, and he's been all over the world. He's studied so much. He is just an incredible human being. And of course, uh, sitting to his left is the uh, wonderful and uh, known to be reserved Professor Zeblon Villagas, also from the East. So, Ningambone um, Tulenje. Uh, 
my grandfather would have would have said, <laughs> In other words, as sharp as a blade. And um, Professor Villagazi, uh, when he was appointed, I remember one of the headlines in the business day said, this is the headline, Vets appoints Katle Hongborn, nuclear physicist, Zeblon Villagazi, to lead institution. And I was thinking, what if he was born in Sentin? Would they say Vets appoints Sentin born? <laughs> Be that as it may, uh, Professor Villagazi joined, uh, joined VETS uh, in January 2014 as Deputy uh, Vice Chancellor, Research, uh, Postgraduate Affairs, and was promoted to the position of Vice Principal in April 2020. He has served as Group Executive for Research and Development at the Nuclear Energy Corporation of South Africa and as Director of Itemba Labs. Um, he's born in Katlehong, Eguruleni. Dr. Uh, Professor Villagazi obtained his PhD from VETS in 1998. Where were you in 1998? Make this year your 1998 start. He was one of the first students from Africa to conduct PhD research at the European Center for Nuclear Research in the Sand in Geneva, Switzerland. And he too has got so many achievements. I will just stop there, but we honor you and we appreciate you. And of course, um, uh, I will not uh, go too much into uh, Professor Khatebe's own uh, background, but uh, safe to say, if you are joining us for the first time, he is the big cheese here. This is his uh, idea to have Unleashing Leadership Potential, ULP. And uh, he was a uh, chairman at Sasol, He's uh, achieved so much. Uh, he's got an MBA and he's got a beautiful family. And my favorite, uh, more than the kids and Theo, is uh, Mama Joyce Hatter. She is, she's the real boss. Uh, 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 so thank you uh, very much for uh, hosting us. But can I start now? Let's have a conversation. Can I start uh, perhaps by uh, asking you, Professor Khadewe, uh, what is it about your background where you grew up in Katlehong that has carved your way to where you are now? So if you look back from the nucleus where you started, what was the sort of, what were the, not the influencer as in Instagram, but what were the influencing factors for you? Thank you very much, uh, Milton, uh, for, for this opportunity of uh, sharing together with these extremely wise people, uh, wise men from the East, we're all from Katleong. There's something about Katleong. Katleong means, uh, uh, um, my suit is right, place of success. Uh, and, and, and that's why I was so, uh, so proud that we, we gather here. There's something about Katleong which uh, is inspiring. I grew up in Skosana, and I was born in 23, uh, uh, Skosana section. First, I think the person who had a huge impact in my life uh, in, 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 in 23, obviously my mom and dad, but my grandmother, you know, grandmothers have got that kind of a touch, um, and then uh, as I grew up and I went to school, uh, as soon as I could count at the age of seven, my grandfather who was a a, a, a businessman who started a small shop in Katlehong uh, got me to come and work as a, uh, a, a, as a as a shop assistant. These days it would be called uh, child labor, but uh, <laughs> uh, but it was such a valuable experience to be inspired by him, mentored by him. His name is Philmon Khadebe. He's every time I speak about leadership, is everything that I know about leadership. It was it, it was it was from from him. And uh, so I think just growing in that robust, very difficult circumstances, but having a family that is extremely supportive and encouraging uh, and also giving you opportunity to learn business at a very early age uh, is what really inspired me. Thank you very much. And uh, what about uh, Professor Mohalis? So first, let me pay my respect to Ubabumuris Khadeh. Upungane. 
ngithi mkhulu kabhungane inkalankala yasimlanjeni uma khulu khulu khubu ya hayi hayi chikele fatsi jiwe ke marwana ya khelwa metsi jiwe ke magala for being an adjunct professor it's been long in coming yeah. i'm glad that yesterday they confirmed what all of us already know have felt and experienced katlong a place of success because we are forcibly removed from what you got all this was the seventh land expropriation without compensation by the national party government we know of kofifi of district 6 of sofia town the old government had 10 land expropriations without compensation when our government wants to talk about it today they say no no you will scare the investors because you have to change the constitution we have changed the constitution many times even by this anc led government the first was the floor crossing constitution here and we did which allowed the anc to rule for the first time in the western Cape, because the math would never allow the anc to rule there unless they change that math because white people are less than 10 percent 8.3 percent in the rest of the country but 22 percent in the western Cape. africans are 90 percent everywhere else in fact black people in general 79 percent africans but in the western cape they're only 38 percent so when you look at the so-called colors and white people are 62 percent people who have been taught to aspire to be white <laughs> so it's not going to be uh, easy so we enjoyed being in Katlehom because all of us shared that in common we were dumped here and you know the national party was very good they would never dump, just dump you by accident they would do geological studies to make sure that where they dump you it must be barren it must be arid there must be no mineral resources because they learned northwest with the Bafuken tribe that they sat on the richest deposits of platinum. They didn't want to make that mistake. So we were part of those people that were forced in 13% of the land. But we didn't know that we were poor because all the houses looked the same, four-roomed houses. The richest amongst us would have big windows, they would have stoops, and their gate would close on its own. Not because they had electricity or motors, but because they put a spring that you push it, it would yank it back. <laughs> That's me. That's your upbringing. Yeah. Oh, it's that spring. <laughs> and uh, Professor Vilagazi, I know we must, uh, uh, even before we carry on, with just a disclaimer. Uh, Villagazi Street is not about you in person. <laughs> Milton, where do I start? Yeah. You know, how can you top that? Yeah. Um, first, also like to uh, congratulate uh, Bramoris. Uh, I had nothing to do with it at all. Uh, nor did I have anything to do with your appointment. And uh, all I just did was to tell the Chancellor, Dr. Judith Lamini, and the Chair of the Council, uh, Mr. Isaac Shonga, that you know we happen to have gone to the same high school, Foxes. Uh, which is called from High School, but he was a few years ahead of me. He might look younger than I am, yeah. because of the business must fall in pressure. He's aging a little bit, but uh, I thought corporate was making you older, but it seems like higher education is much tougher than corporate world. Um, but I think that it's actually such an honor uh, to be among these distinguished gentlemen who happen to be from Katlong. By the way, you know, in, a t in tough times, you made reference to um, the Book of Matthew under the rule of Herod and the occupation by um, Tiberius, the then emperor of Rome, it was very tough, right? Three men came from the east. So clearly the sun rises from the east, not from the west, <laughs> to use our tents. But uh, I, <laughs> um, so, 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 I mean, I think, I think we share a similar experience. Of course, they are a little older, older than, than I am, and they were pioneers. I mean, I can talk to uh, Bramoris, who was, like, was actually uh, just a few blocks away from me, I'm from 505 Skosana section, uh, next to the, the, the main hospital, which is the intersection point for all people from, you know, sections of Katlohong to where we were. I think also, you know, it's a strength of the family. I'm privileged, despite not having had all the material advantages to have grown, to have been lucky. I really have had a guiding star of luck, more than anything else, not once 
great uh, talents. Uh, a very strong family, two great parents, uh, two wonderful pe people who have departed uh, many years ago. Um, great army of siblings, and those siblings don't include my parents, uh, you know, what they would call eight children that they had. You know, we had like, in a four-room house, which went to become an eight-room house, almost at some stage, extended kids. I don't know how you managed to fit into that, you know. And also, uncles would come, and the people who influenced me the most were my siblings. We were a family that actually liked ideas, debate. I had friends also who came from such families as well. So actually, one is a village child. And I had an uncle who actually played a key role in the world of ideas, music, sport, and basically love of knowledge. I think that to me is what shaped me. Just love and discipline and a bit of hard, tough love as well. Brilliant. Um, can I say Bonang, Professor Mohale? Yeah, please just dispense the titles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let's, yes. let it, let's let, it, let's let it uh, flow. Thank you very much. Uh, you heard it. It's on the record. Um, Bonang, you came from Chapo section. So you are not part of the inner circle here of Skosan. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want you to share with us what your experience in leadership has taught you about where our country finds itself now and where we think it ought to be and where it should be going. So first, the exciting milestones of the 21st century will not be because of technology, but because of this expanding concept of what it means to be truly human. Especially now that the whole world is under lockdown. <clears throat> and none of us were there during February of 1918 that lasted up until the April of 1920, the Spanish flu, which didn't originate in Spain. <clears throat> that lasted two years, came in four consecutive waves, affected 500 million people at that time. That was 38% of the global population, killed more than 20 million people, more than the First World War did, because the World War killed 17 people, 17 million people. And next month will be locked down for a year. So 332 days, and yet we are social animals in bone and marrow. How do you engage, interact, and interface? Because we yearn hugging people. We are tactile human beings. We kiss. And all we had to do was to wave through our windows. And I just touched his elbow. So leadership, it's about being shaped by the context, your own context, but also what you are called upon as the pain to solve. Because creativity is thinking new things, but innovation is doing new things. So leadership, more than anything else, it's about the doing, the execution. And our country is the one thing that they find they struggle a little bit. So how do you as a township thug? <clears throat> Accepting that a child that is not embraced by the village will burn the village down in order to feel its warmth. That almost 12 months that we've been under lockdown, <clears throat> my grandmother used to say, when the fisherwomen and the fishermen can't go out to sea for whatever reason, they repair their nets. What are we doing to repair our own nets as human beings? Because if you are a, an executive like we are, of course you are concerned about delivering excellence and financial stability and this notion of final accountability. But in the pandemic, that can be the first thing that you discuss when you talk to your colleagues for the first time through Zoom, Skype, or even telephone when you know that they are not in a good headspace, 
So HSSE assumes a new meaning where the well-being of your employees ought to be number one. Because health is not just the absence of disease and infirmity, but it's a state of physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being. It's a state. How can we take our people into that state, especially mental health? So suicides have gone up. Depression has gone up. Admissions have gone up because we are not designed for this. Therefore, I think to answer your question as a leader, your job is to say my number one biggest, most valuable asset is our people. Not the bricks and mortar, not the products and services that we provide, but their well-being, their mental health. Therefore, when I engage, interact, and interface with them is to say, are you okay? And pause to listen for an answer. Actively listen and hear so that when somebody says I'm struggling, my next question is, can I do something? How can I help you? Therefore, the narrative has to be that of care, of kindness, of humanity, of wanting to be deeply connected to other human beings. Thank you, my brother. That's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, I, I, I suppose these grandmothers, they cloned them. <laughs> because uh, uh, each time I listen to people, when they quote their grandmother, they're really uh, talking about st real stalwarts. Um, but Maurice, how, what about you? What are your thoughts about where we need to be sort of channeling our energies, as uh, Bonang has just said? Well, Bonang has spoken in, in broad philosophical uh, uh, understanding of leadership. I just want to be very practical. Our country is going through major challenges, and leaders need to rise to that challenge. And one of the biggest challenges we're facing is corruption. And I'm very passionate about one of the reasons uh, I wanted to come to the business school is to really develop the next generation of leaders that are going to be ethical, authentic, and will be committed to make a difference in this world. And I always say when I speak to my mentees here at ULP, what you need to do is to make this world a little bit better than you found it. Not make it worse than you found it. And most of our leaders right now, and let's be honest, throughout the continent, is just they make this world a little bit worse than they found it. So what do we need to do? We need to basically make sure that we generate leaders and the next generation of leaders, especially if coming from Katlewong. I want to speak to the Katlewong youngsters because I remember when I was in Katlewong, you know, my role model was the guy with Kwasana Yekoka, blind, food scissors practice, and I see in Tuana. I mean, look at that. That kind of role model was terrible. It was terrible. You know? And that's what we're taught just to be violent, taught to be unethical, taught to be uh, thieves. I mean, the person you admire, out to be, it was. But, you know, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that whole system. Uh, in the, it, it, it created that. But obviously, now the political system has nurtured it. And, uh, and we have to, we have to, because what does corruption? It robs the poor. It exacerbates poverty. It exacerbates inequality. It exacerbates uh, diseases. Our continent is facing it. That's the one. That's more passionate. But I mean, uh, 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 there's three trends that are happening in the world right now. This pandemic has shown us that the pre covid world is not going to come back. It's the world has changed. So we need to develop leaders that are nimble, agile, that's going to be able to make a huge impact. The second one, I mean, I'm an energy guy. This transition from high carbon economy to low carbon economy is a massive change. And we need to make sure we develop leaders that will take us into this new uh, clean and, and green energy. And how do we do it without actually leaving too many people behind and causing more poverty? How do we do it? When we leave uh, our country, which is endowed with coal, for instance, do we neutralize that? Should it be? We must have it, what we call climate justice. So we need leaders. And then, obviously, finally, the digital transformation is massive. 
And uh, he, he has, the, the, the last week here when we had Mar uh, Marwala, he, he was talking about digital illiteracy being now the biggest challenge that we're facing. You know, you know, when we grew up, it was literacy. You know, when you could read and write, especially in the rural areas, the old people will call you, you know, and, 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 and you read. But now digital literacy is going to be the game changer, and it's going to decide who wins and who doesn't win. So we need leaders that are going to lead in that cutting edge. So that's what I'm seeing uh, as, as, as a deaf is a responsibility for us as leaders. Very much. When you're talking about digital literacy, you know, in my mind, the picture that comes up is those parliamentary uh, meetings that we watch on the TV. Yeah. And all you hear is, unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute yourself, honorable, unmute yourself. <laughs> you realize this digital literacy uh, is required there. Babu uh, Vilagazi, what are your thoughts? <laughs> You know, Bramuris and, the, the, uh, and, and, and Bonang, I mean, these two, I would call them uh, scholar corporate leaders as well. You know, philosopher kings of corporate world have actually almost covered ground. But I just need to just add a little bit on what uh, Morris said and just tell you at least the slight dimension I want to add uh, is that you mentioned this corp um, digital leadership. Né? You know, if you look at history, for example, the last 100 years, I mean, that's the year that we've been basically ramped up in technology. There were powers, global powers, and I think that's on to tell, check how does Africa fit within this whole global map. Um, of course, there was the rise of Germany with this strong science, and uh, many, of, many, of, many of them went to America thanks to Hitler's uh, very stupid views with regard to anti-Semitism. Lots of talent went to America, and guess who actually became the first nation to usher a new age. The nuclear age was America, right? And therefore we had uh, the two main political elites competing for global domination, driven by what you call two basically technologies that you grew up under, that shaped us. The nuclear age, that determined world power, and the rocket age, because therefore you can take that nuclear bomb and put it into a rocket, then you have basically the control of space. It shaped, America was shaken to the core, MIT, all this, institutions were pushed to the limit, investments were made to leapfrog what basically was a third world country a few, few years, a century ago. America was a third world country of gunslingers yeah. into a global power, super power. Don't yeah. forget, a European backwater where basically they removed all the riffraff they didn't want yeah. and sent them to America. Yeah. And that country rose in 1950 to become the world leading nation, right? Um, that defined the 20th century, which of course America prevailed because the Soviet Union got bankrupt and collapsed. And now you are seeing a new battlefront that uh, Morris alluded to. The new battlefront won't be about you know, the space race, Brezhnev and Gorbachev and so on and so forth. Uh, Brezhnev and, Car and Nixon, Gorbachev and Reagan, you know, I remember those things. No, it will be about the battle of the, tech of the technosphere. The 5G quantum computing. The economist every year tells you who is investing in quantum computing in this tech. So therefore, the next frontier of battle is invisible to us. That's the next battle of technosphere. It's playing out in diplomacy, in the Karakhid that is showing between the outgoing president, who is gone now, and, who, and, and, and Xi Jinping. So it's becoming almost like digital diplomacy of actually who controls, as President Putin said, he or she, or rather quoted to be said, to have said, he who controls AR rules the world. And that's what the Marola does to Chinese, my friend. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is, to use the Latin word, quo varis, Africa, siempre epinovi, something new out of Africa. And we are actually nothing but spectators. You've got the ringside seat. I mean, you've been spectators for the last 500 years of human growth. And that actually is what really cooks my noodle, <laughs> keeps me awake at night, is where do we feature? So, so that is actually <laughs> what, uh, and finally, uh, if you just indulge me a little bit, um, having said that, because I was just trying to extend from what Morris said, uh, in terms of response to COVID, you have mentioned corruption, you have mentioned other issues, but the key thing as well is kind of a Roosevelt moment, which I've been preaching about to my, yes. to my, to my team. And I think maybe I'll talk about it uh, in a second, but I maybe I should if, if, I, if I might. Is that this is nothing new, this too shall, shall pass. Yes. You know, in 1933, Roosevelt took over America, height of Great Depression, four years into the deep research, deep depression, I mean, I'm not an economist here. Yeah. I don't, I'm a, I've been a sheltered academic all, all my life. 
four years into deep depression, Capone rules Chicago. John Dillinger, whose movies I saw in those uh, by scope, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a brand, yeah. you know? Uh, here is a man taking over a society in 1933, a democratic, a democratic society, as it were at the time, because it discriminated against blacks in the South, in the world where democracy itself was falling apart. False prophets that promised to give you light and become these leaders, right? These proto-fascists that arose, nothing new there, became monsters of the 20th century. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Imperial Japan. Incredible war criminals that ruled that world and were central strongmen. Shaky Britain. And here is a man who is taking presidency, 1933, when his body is failing him, riddled with polio, tells Americans and the world that we have nothing to fear but fear itself, we must look to the better angels of us, right? And then someone asked him, some journalist from, I think, the New York Times, New Yorker, or Washington Post, that Mr. President, you know, looking at his, you know, a weak state of physical self, because the president must be robust, six feet tall, being an all-American leader like, you know, John Wayne. And here's a frail man assuming this office. And said, why are you such an optimist, you know? And he said, when you spend two years bedridden, and after two years you are able to wiggle your toe, you have every reason to be optimistic. So leadership is minted in the foundry of fire itself, not in good times. So we need to give people hope in a moment of fire, the furnace of fire. Diamonds are created under conditions in the alluvial plains of earth of high temperature and pressure. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's beautiful, my goodness. Um, can I move you to where you are, um, so to speak? I'll start with you, Pramoris. You uh, left the corporate world. I mean, you could be chairing more boards, making more money, spending it. I'm not sure if you'd be wearing gold chains, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe you'd be sitting in a jet and counting it like Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> but no, you're not interested in that. You're going to education, academic. Why? Very important uh, question you ask, actually, very great question. After 35 years of being in corporate and, and being a business leader, particularly in the oil industry, they used to call us uh, oil magnates, <laughs> and being blessed by the industry uh, in, in material terms, you come to a question where you've got to ask yourself, how many chickens can you eat? And uh, uh, I mean, how many cars can you drive? Uh, how many beautiful houses can you have? If you continue down that route of chasing material stuff, you may miss your purpose in life. And so I've been very deliberate about purpose. Um, and, and I thought, you know, instead of me, as you say, you know, uh, now playing golf three times a day, I thought, man, this latter part of my life, I've got to give it meaning and purpose. And there's no higher purpose than to really, in my book, see talent, identify it, polish it, develop it, and let it fly. And that's what Unleashing Leadership Potential is about, is I leaving it. And I, thought, I just saw, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years here, and I, when this opportunity came, I thought, well, this is an opportunity to do it now on a national scale and on an international scale. And because I know what it means when you come out of a business school. I came out of that business school, best business school, 25 years ago. It just gives you confidence to take the world. And it gives you confidence to do things. And most of the achievements that I have been able to is because of that. So if I can give these young people that opportunity to, to fly and unleash their potential, but more importantly, make sure that they are value-based leadership and they can really go out there and become authentic leaders and that go on the multiplier effect is even bigger because they can unleash the potential of other people and more and more people and we can create a better society 
So that attracted me, uh, and, uh, and it resonated with deep sense of purpose that is in me. And that's why I'm here. Beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. Ntate uh, Mohale, you are chairman of Bitvest, right? Yeah. You could also be um, maybe not counting hard cash on a private jet like Mayweather. <laughs> But you could be maybe on Instagram showing us your latest bling and so on. <laughs> or enjoying it the way you want to enjoy it. But you also have gone into education. And now you're the chancellor of the University of the Free State, all the way from Katlehong. This is a moment of pride for all Katloholings and all Sowetans, all Guguletans, all Zwides, whichever township you want to think about, Guamashu, Mlazi, everywhere around the country. And um, to see you leave that material world in essence and going into the more academic world, what is that drive for you? So a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And if that candle can light another, you can start a revolution. And in academia, that's what you can do by touching and connecting with people at a really deep and profound level because you have an opportunity to describe, to define, and shape. And it is the shaping that turns me on. So the 21st century will be remembered for many things, but for me, for three things. For putting men on the moon, giving us the internet, but also for letting five million people die of HIV AIDS without lifting a finger. So all of us have the good side about us, but also the dark side. It's the choices we make. When Ubra Morris was speaking, I got goosebumps because it resonates. <clears throat> but this is the essence of who we are. <clears throat> so when you get into a graduation hall and you are from Eilaline in the village, that graduation hall is very hostile to you. You don't see yourself in this. You are lost. When you are a woman and you are black, in South Africa, 27 years into democracy. You don't see the language that you grew up with. You don't see the symbols that are familiar to you and calm you down. You are on edge. You are a temporary sojourner. Therefore, we have an opportunity as African academics to lay the foundation one brick at a time to bring about this notion of an inclusive academic excellence. The emphasis is on inclusive. Because the greatest injustice is exclusion. Black people are not lazy. Women are not afraid of the world of work. They've been both systemically, systematically, chronologically, and methodically excluded. 119 pieces of legislation that says you don't belong here. Therefore, we want to look our children in the eye and say to them collectively, individually and severally, we have ultimately succeeded in overcoming the legacy of apartheid, the legacy of exclusion. So we want to make sure that we bring about public ownership of universities. 26 Public universities must be owned by Memadi Khezi, Linda Demotapo, Hosi Itzile, and say, this is an extension of myself. At the moment, it's not. We want to bring about this notion of social justice. Because a majority of our people today, a medical student says, I cannot be admitted on my final year because I don't have the 50% to pay as admission in an institution of higher learning. So when we became free on the 27th of April, 1994, people who went to university were 7%. We've just moved it up to 11%. 
making us part of an elite. But God be damned if we are going to be elitist in our approach and in our actions. We need to use this eliticism to lift as you rise. Yeah. So that we can include those that have been deliberately excluded. Lastly, we really want to give expression to this notion of academic freedom. You can't be learned when you are wedded to your ideas. It's about debating. It's about critical thought. It's about being curious. It's about helping us to think about the world not as it is, but as it could be. The art of the possible. Kosia. That sentence, the world as it is versus the world as it should be. So I've just been reading Barack Obama's uh, uh, The Promised Land. So what really got Michelle really going was that he invited her in Chicago in one of those uh, when he was still an organizer. And uh, he was giving a speech there to a small group of people in a church on a Saturday afternoon. And the title of his speech was The World As It Is and The World As It Should Be. And when they walked out of that church, Michelle said, oh, God, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going with it. So I, I, I like that, um, uh, that sentence. And actually, you've also preempted my next question, which is definitely going to Professor Villegas, because it's kind of newsy. You know, my background is news. So we love a little bit of vava uh, Prof. But I know you can take the heat. You're a nuclear man. Uh, you know, he mentioned medical students who can't finish 50%. So this morning, there's been a drama at uh, your institution. The SRC there is up in arms. And they've appealed for civil society to come up with 21 million rand so that, uh, for this new academic year, so that over 8,000 students can be helped with their registration. Now, I know that um, uh, Sharona Patel uh, has said that is not true. Um, uh, there's no one who's facing financial exclusion. What are your thoughts, Prof? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, obviously, I'm, you know, a very good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I came from the long left field. What did I say in cricket? Okay, but uh, I'm not pressing. No, no, no. no. We are discussing. Uh, Googly. No, no, I mean, this is among friends. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's what they're. It's uh, the 8,000, I'm not going to go in quibbling about numbers, yes. uh, are those that are potentially at risk, but are those students actually who have got sponsorships, but sponsors haven't come to the party. The NESFA students who are also part of that, of that, of that basket as well. I mean, the numbers drill down to about 2,000 or so that are actually in that high risk category that we're looking into, right? And I think there's it's not that, uh, in fact, the, the SRC and the university uh, are working together. This uh, fundraising concept operates on the basis of them spearheading it, the university providing the institutional infrastructure, and I've, and I've spoken to the SRC president uh, two days ago, to provide the institutional infrastructure because obviously we have got expertise to handle that money. Uh, and I even spoke to one of the potential funders who said, the SC approached me, and I said, of course, it's got the full endorsement of the university, right? It actually, is to me, it shows leadership. I mean, it's leadership training, that you don't have to always go back to the same repertoire of jumping up and down, and it becomes almost like quite boring now. And this was a, a group of young people that said, Vice Chancellor designate last year, here's our, here's our action plan. I said, okay, we'll work with you on this journey. Um, they will fundraise. We do have counter of money we put, to actually just sit money to say, you go for it, right? Then you're still negotiating how you match it. Two is that this is, will be managed by the CFO of the university and under the purview of the university foundation that you'll be, should they raise more than is enough, then uh, it will be part of now the seed for next year. Because this covered, because our university covers a huge range of students, about 20 per, or 25 percent of our students are NESFA students. Because if it's make, it's got a large number of what I would call middle class students, lower type of middle, middle class, and a proportion of students that are, of course, self-paying. So it's got a very eclectic mix 
of income streams. And that's first covered. And of course, the, uh, those that can afford, can afford. There's a huge dilute range of those that are actually too rich to, what? Too, 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 poor to, too, too, too poor to afford and too rich to qualify for NESFAS. And I think that is really the, the challenge and it has been. And I think it's not that I'm going to question what the SSC is saying. Obviously, I'm not sure about that medical student. I mean, that matter has been resolved. It's just one of those kind of like process issues, really. But that's probably the principle that you're operating under. So therefore, there's no, there's no you know, he said, she said. It's just basically, you know, uh, an, initi an initiative that has our fullest support, and we are right behind, behind them taking it. Well, Very practical question. I mean, that well, is... Well, well <laughs> you, you, you've held it like a pro. <laughs> 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 uh, no, thank you very much. That's very informative. And, uh, you know, current affairs inform how people shape their ideas and so on. But it leads me, actually, this is very nice. It's kind of it's flowing. Yes, yeah, okay. Still, uh, I'm by no means underplaying the situation. No, we sure. Do, we do are facing... Yes. Crisis in university. And they're not the only country, by the way. Yeah. United States, right? The next, uh, what do you call this thing, best ends and uh, run of the banks. Yeah. Student debt in America now sits at about uh, 1.5 trillion US dollars and rising. In fact, it's $50,000 per student. And rising. Which is, what is, so, is actually the hot button issue inside the White House now. Right. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. Very true. Um, the key thing, I remember I watched a film many years ago, which um, uh, was called Shadowlands. I don't know if you've ever come across a very British dark movie, lots of crying and sadness. But um, one of the famous lines there, uh, yes, uh, we, we read to know that we're not alone. It's very uh, beautiful. I never forgot it. When I walked out, I knew I was not alone in whatever I was uh, confronting. So thank you very much. It's good to uh, hear that from you. And um, it segues very nicely into my next question, which is the challenges and opportunities facing higher education in South Africa in uh, broad terms. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, OK, OK, back to you. It's like um, Turkey voting itself for um, <laughs> Christmas lunch. <laughs> The, the first, I mean, on the positive side, right? I think what you have in South Africa, fellow South Africans, is something that is fused with power. That is our projection of global power, of power in the global south. Yes, not all universities are the same, because they vary in shape and size. And I think that one thing that I'm proud of in South Africa, despite all the things that you've mentioned in terms of the institutional baggages we carry, we have arguably the best higher educational system on the continent. In the global south, we have universities here with minimal funding that punch way above the weight. In response to, to, to COVID, for example, we, are, we have the capacity to do mRNA in this day and age. Our modeling, our analysis, understanding, and the way we've influenced, helped government in responding using science and facts, right, to respond to this as something that actually has shown that we sit here with what is a national treasure. It is incumbent upon us as new leaders to not to destroy it, but to take it to the next level. Yeah. So I think the future for higher education is a bit, but we cannot afford to fail. This is the last well-functioning also entity. Our universities, some, some don't function well, but a significant number of them are well-run by people of integrity, very difficult individuals, but they believe that they've got their mission critical assignment is to educate the next generation, produce, new, create new knowledge, and as uh, my um, brothers here have said, you know, make this a better country. So that is point number one. The, the crisis really is one that you can focus on, right? It is largely about, you know, financial support. If uh, someone feels that the, you know, uh, poverty is violence, to use the word. So when someone feels that they're hungry, they are angry. And therefore they feel alienated because the other kid, the other kid who's in the same class as them is thinking about the next skiing trip. You know, that is exclusionary. Not by being excluded, but you're being included, but you feel excluded because the social fabric among impressionable young people is alienating uh, for a child coming from Lusikisik to a child coming from Santin. 
That now we see how the other half lives because they tell you on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. And that to me is the yeah. biggest challenge. I mean, finance will always continue to be a challenge. There will never be a land of plenty. Uh, but that will be, to me, the kind of inequalities, how they play themselves. They remain an existential problem. And I think I cannot find a solution to them. I mean, I was, at, I was doing the road shows, what are virtual road shows nowadays, on, to, on Zoom. Uh, and I did tell colleagues that I don't have answers. Help me. Well, that's fascinating. And what, 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 what about you, Pramoris? What, what, what's your view of opportunities and challenges facing higher education? Well, I'm, I'm new in this field of, uh, of, of higher education, but geez, I started uh, leading the business school in the midst of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember the financial mail asking me, what on hell, what has gone wrong with you? <laughs> this COVID has changed the whole learning uh, experience. Uh, um, the face-to-face -face learning experience is critical. Uh, you know, when I was at, um, all of us were studying, you've got a teacher there lecturing you, and then you debate in the class, and you've got syndicates, and you've got assignments together, and then that uh, rubs off, you know, and you form networks that actually stand you in good stead going forward, even in your career. So for me, the challenge is how do we do education now in such a way that we, we have to use the technology, obviously, and the, the Zooms and the, face, the Teams, but also create an opportunity for this hybrid blended learning uh, in order to effectively enhance the learning experience of, uh, of our learners. So, I think that's a big challenge. It's a big challenge because uh, uh, our, our educators themselves were not educated in that environment. I mean, we now massively had to swift at the fast pace to get the lecturers to be able to lecture and teach through, through uh, uh, remote teaching and students themselves struggling. And sometimes you sit in a class, the connectivity becomes a problem. And so, I think that whole world, we need to navigate it. We need to get ourselves. Uh, I'm confident that we will adapt and we will uh, move in very fast. And if we do so, I think uh, it will open up even much more bigger opportunities for us. Uh, Dr. Mohale? So this relationship is incestuous. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, because uh, vets, it's my alma mater. Yeah, okay. That's where I studied MBBCH. Yeah. Um, Hillbro, we were the first group to go up to the hill in part time. Yeah. Two, I serve on his foundation for the last five years. So when he says Vets Foundation, he looks at me. <laughs> that's my job. But the real challenge is the students that you see at Vets who are studying and passing, and nobody knows where they stay. Because they sleep in the library, and they come up in the morning, and they wash the whole body from the basin. They are so poor that other students know. So in the library, they've put a brown box at the corner. Those that have discreetly buy a sandwich and deposit it in those boxes. And they come out at night to go and get their supper. The challenge is that Stats SA says in South Africa today, in this country, in this context, when so many of us dare to hope that joy and peace will prevail, only 14.3% of households have direct access to the internet. So it leaves the other 85% outside. So when you say to employees, when work from home, you, that's where you are sending them to. Zero connectivity. It's the fact that even when they are at home and you've given them a laptop and a smartphone, a majority of them, to get home, they have to get into a taxi. That transports 13.5 million people a day, and yet they're not subsidized. It's unsafe. It's inaccessible. And it's the surest way of making sure that both the laptop and the smartphone gets confiscated. 
The challenge is that even when they make it at home, and now they've got their laptops and they're on Zoom, Skype, Microsoft Teams, and they're working. Since the 1st of January 2008, that's 13 years ago, we've had rolling blackouts of electricity. So each time ESCOM goes to level two, it wipes off an entire percentage onto the national GDP. So at 5% of GDP, that's 21% of revenue. <laughs> so we can see that our problem is going to be finance. And the problem is self-made, self-harm, self-inflicted. Because you can't call yourself a country and a leadership, and yet in 13 years you are unable to solve the rolling blackouts. And you have spent more money than anybody else in the world. We are the fourth in the world to build the biggest coal-fired power state, not one, but we decided to do three concurrently, simultaneously, and in parallel. Midupi was the first, Kusile was the second, and then we did Ingula, which is hydroelectric. On the other side, we financed Kahora Basa with the Mozambicans to give us hydroelectric power. We financed Inga 1, Inga 2, but Inga 3, the mighty Inga, we underwriting 65% of that. The plan was good, but of the 1.4 billion people that are in absolute darkness, 673 million of them are found in Africa. Out of the 1.3 billion, 55 countries that speak 2,000 languages. So you can see that unless we call ourselves leaders, we should be able to say, this is where we are now. This is where we want to be tomorrow. It should not take us 10 years to solve the problems that we have. Because our problem with electricity generation in this country, it's not money. In fact, we have wasted much more. So Midupi started at 30 billion, it's about 55 billion. Kusile exactly the same thing. In fact, even when you go back to the new product pipeline, budgeted at 7.2 billion, delivered at 19.7 billion. We are unable to deliver mega projects on time, in full, and on budget. Behind schedule. Seven years! Badly designed, badly, but that's what the minister says. So how do you call yourself a leader? How can the rest of the world have confidence in you when you can't even fix your own backyard? Lastly, I think the challenge is that we're not learning from the best in the world. Harvard University is the richest university in the world today. The results show because they've got the biggest endowment, 80 billion US dollars. Endowment says you are giving money, you're not touching the capital, you're just using the interest, followed by Stanford at 40 billion. <clears throat> and the reason why they're amongst the top five in the world, <laughs> you look at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, you look at the Institute of the Empresa in Madrid, Europe's number one business school. They all have one thing in common. They've moved away from having PhD academics as heads of business schools. I'm being very specific. They're getting business people to be heads of business because you are designing a curriculum for who? For business. These are the people who will say, this is how we want you to grow our own timber. So until and unless VETS has a sizable endowment and they live on just the interest, at the moment, everything about South Africa, we're eating the seeds. <laughs> what are we going to use to plant for tomorrow? So the Stone Age did not end because men ran out of stone. The Stone Age ended because men found a better, more effective, and efficient way of doing things. The carbon footprint will not be less because we have depleted all the coal from the ground. Yeah. It will end because we have found better ways of providing energy. In integrated energy, we now call it mobility. This is the only continent in the world where the sun shines. 328 days a year. A 
and yet the world authority on solar energy is Germany. That has no more than 90 days. The wind is free. And we have towns that are called windy cities. Three of the mightiest rivers in the world, including the mighty Zambezi, is found here. Enough to generate electric, uh, uh, hydroelectric power for all 1.3 billion of us and the access to send to Europe. Pameling at the Vic Falls at 53,000 tons of water per second. But we're not harnessing that force, that energy, that impetus. So poverty and riches are both an outcome of our ability to think. Ah, guys, where's the applause? Ah. <laughs> um, I, this is incredible because I'm now feeling in a very Kabbalistic way that uh, somehow, uh, although I'm of a lesser mind, we are connected because all the discussions are coming to exactly where I want to go next. So you were talking about uh, Madrid and business schools and Harvard, and uh, we touched uh, for obvious reasons on vets. But I just wanted you um, not to put you in a predicament about talking about other academic institutions. But I just want you to think broadly about, um, we spoke about finance and so on. What, what do you think needs to be done in terms of institutions? So we spoke about students, uh, ideas, but what can the institutions do, particularly in South Africa, um, to try and leverage on that great potential that we have? Bob Villagas. Uh, first, just before I start, yeah. I've sat in many panels. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know Dr. Mohale. Like, he's got like, statistics rolling out of his ears, and I do do my like, Wikipedia checks, and I can't keep up. <laughs> His, his, his ability to handle numbers, I've never sat with any panelist in my life. Even I've sat with some of the smartest physicists, but none of them can draw statistics such high level of precision and speed, yeah. like Dati Muhale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, and I'm not a generous man. Uh, I don't give. <laughs> we, we are very open. We say in public what we say in private. What did I say when I saw you this afternoon? <laughs> I spoke to him about his ability of just rolling out the stats and methodically explaining uh, chapter and verse uh, without really reading any document. It's very impressive. Uh, Indeed, what he speaks yeah. about, uh, is about the fact that we are not short of leadership and thinkers in this country. I mean, just yes. now let's go, let's go to, the, yes. to, the, to, to the question. I think I'll, I'll not deliberate much on, but I think it's about actually what do you think are the challenges of higher education, right, if I, if I heard you correctly? Um, the challenges of higher education are actually sustainability, you know, and I'm not using it in a glib way, because we've had in the past to, 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 to import professors from America, from all over the world, who actually were willing to relocate, relocate here through what was basically a special program called the South African Research Chair Initiative to actually have the enough students who will meet the demands of the square kilometer array. An incredibly beautiful strategic intervention. Yes, I'm, I'm a physicist, I might have a bit of a bias, but uh, I think it is something that is actually as far-sighted of, of, of our government. And now, they are beginning to you know, do that. Uh, at the same time, though, we are not getting the right, you know, enough of a pipeline of talent in the country when we have only, I'm going to not say that, 100,000 of the million kids who enter school only 100,000 pass metric. Only at VETS, only basically 5,000 enter the university out of a pool of about 70,000 that apply. So there's a lot of culling even upstream. What happens to that? that? That basically means that the higher educational system, which is the main focus in the media because it's the apex, is the tip of the iceberg. If you look beyond even the post school secondary education system, we have lost the other uh, 900,000 children that didn't finish their metric, where are they? And I think that is a question that we never, we've never asked in this country. And that is a challenge you are facing. And I think that is something to me that we need to drill deeper and understand. So our problems are not with the apex. It is, if you drill deeper, uh, we need to think about how we get those beyond even the TVET system. Uh, so South Africa sometimes seems to be able to 
master the art of wastage. And you can turn it around. I mean, the, the, the many potential areas you can work around. I'm not going to you know, give you a doom and gloom. But I think that the challenge is, of course, money investment. You mentioned institutional culture and long-term sustainability. And I think uh, the solutions have already been presented. That at the business school, if you take that pioneering act that I'm proud of that you did, uh, to actually say that this is the way the future is heading towards, is that. And of course, if you're talking about the digital disruptions, uh, they will actually change it. And the fact that the gap is widening between us and the global north, right? With East, the East rising. Do you know that uh, uh, the only countries in the con the only country in the continent that is grappling with the challenges, and that saddens me because I go to this continent quite to, to across the continent quite a lot, is us. You know, what actually is much is scarier is despite all this ringing uh, hand ringing we are facing. Is that I went to Ghana, I went to Niger, I went to um, uh, East Africa. I mean, their state of higher education is even a more parallel state. They make uh, turf uh, look like Harvard. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not saying this to be. It really is. But the determination of those students is quite incredible. So I think also as well, we need as South Africans, even our students, to have a reality check as well. That you do sit in a position of, you know, to use the Einstein and relativity, relative privilege in the entire higher educational sector within the continent itself, our mother continent. This is the Bafana, Bafana uh, syndrome, <laughs> where everybody has got kid to play, they've got manicured lawns, and they get beaten by like Pongoland. <laughs> and, then, and then the question okay, is therefore, yeah, because, the, yeah. the question therefore is why do why our best students? in kind of what I would call for the want of better way, the hard sciences, not South African. Drawn from those countries of extreme impoverishment. You mentioned the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array um, uh, Telescope. It's quite uh, an amazing project. I've been to Carnarvon a few times. Um, and uh, incidentally, tonight, being a newsman, if you're interested in the news, tonight the uh, Mars rover called Perseverance is landing on Mars at about 2055 GMT, more or less. So yeah, don't quote me. But think about it. It's, it's quite inspirational, that kind of thing. Uh, those are the things that move me. I'm, uh, these people are the same as us. They have nose like us. They get flu like us. And they still manage to go to other continents. Why can't we do it? You know? So um, uh, the SKA is very, very impressive. Um, can I? Uh, before we move to opening up for questions, I think we're coming up to that time now. Um, can I just ask, uh, are, are you ready for questions now, or do you want me to ask a question? What, what's your feel? OK, OK. So, um, oh, what's up? OK. So, um, yes. Dr. Maurice wants to add. Yes, yes, please, uh, please. What needs to and about these institutions. Yes, yes. <clears throat> well, I've spent my life in the corporate world, and I've seen the production of students coming out of our academic uh, institutions, and there's been a mismatch. Uh, so we had to, in the corporate world, start to retrain the student, have bridging programs, and basically make them to, to fit the world of work. Uh, and what I, I realize, what we need to do, that is why one of the reasons why I'm, I've joined the academic world, is to really help our students understand the world of work. And it is changing very fast. And it is changing very quickly. So it is very important that the institutions start to really understand the needs of the industry, understand the, the, the dynamism that is taking place, understanding the culture that is taking place, as I'm sitting at the business school now, I'm actually shaking the culture. And I'm saying, we, we must run the business school like a business, <laughs> not like an NGO, as a, as a business, so that what we produce here is people that actually will be fit very well and hit the ground running. And most of our students here, the world, the world of work, totally unprepared. And, and, and therefore, for me, the institution, we need to be very close to the world of work as, as academic institution. We must be so intertwined that we should be able to be seamless uh, so that our kids can go 
out of our academic institution and hit the ground running and be very effective and make a difference? Actually, this would, you've probably answered this question, but I would allow you to elaborate. Yeah. Because Tsepo Mokoto <laughs> has just asked a question. How are business schools and institutions of higher learning transforming themselves to ensure they produce graduates that can participate and seize the opportunities of the new normal? That's, yeah. that's exactly yeah, what you were saying. That's the point. That's the that's that's point. It's a very valid question, very good question. We, we need to spend an in, inordinate amount of time understanding that well. Fortunately, some of us have spent that time, so we're bringing that value to the business school. To basically question, for instance, right now, I'm asking the entire school to review all our courses. Review the MBA program. Is it still as relevant as it was before? When it was not a, 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 a 4IR, it was a 3IR or 2, I, two, two, two revol the second revolution. We were producing students that was, we probably will make good in a third revolution. But now we're in a 4IR. So it's very important. So, so it starts with upskilling, relearning and uh, of our own teaching force. Exposing them, running the workshops for them and making sure that they're closer to the uh, uh, institution. It means we must bring a business people. I'm planning a program of having a lot of the bonangs of this world coming to our business schools to come and teach and, 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 and lecture or part time and share the stories and what is required. And this kind of symbiotic relationship needs to be strengthened because without that interface engagement all the time, uh, we, will, we will miss the boat. We'll produce students that are completely uh, not fit for purpose. A very interesting one uh, from Mudise Sitwaba. Uh, he says, I understand we're on higher education, but can we address also the issue of vocational education? I believe this was, will also equip the youth to be multi skilled. Uh, the panel may elaborate. Panel, elaborate. So, so this is the greatest tragedy. And I'm adding on on what he said about some of the challenges that are facing us. So we spend 50 billion rands on TVET colleges with a completion rate of 3%. And yet, we refuse to learn from countries like Germany. So Germany makes <coughs> the most aspirational cars in the world. Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen, Porsche. But the education system is actually vocational. A majority of their citizens don't even go up to what we used to call metric, now grade 12. They catch you at standard eight. And they say, let's teach you to be the best car mechanic in the world. And look at the cars that they are producing. So in this country, 1996, I was the MD of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company. At our own cost, we used to train lift mechanics. Four years. They write a government ticket. We used to pay them a stipend of 3,500 a month. They come with a certificate on Tuesday, on Friday, their salary goes up to 10%. Those are the people that now live in houses in Don Park, and Leon Dale, called blue collar workers. So we find and, and paid for by private companies. We come in under Dula Omar, I think at that time, and then we come with outcome-based education, which works best in developed countries, because sometimes we forget fit for purpose. And we close teachers training colleges, nurses colleges, and these vocational schools, Ambach. Yeah. And the first year after we have amalgamated all of this, there's a stampede at UJ. A mother who had come with her daughter gets killed because we have removed the other options, channeled them to just one. Here's the last one, funneled them just, just one. Here's the last comment. You know, the Africaners created their own institutions. Honors de Port, University of Pretoria, Rand Afrikaans Universiteit and Stellenbosch. 99.8% of all their MPs came from Stellenbosch. 
not by accident, by design. We decided to amalgamate this. But what they did was, even those institutions that provide medicine, MBBCH, some call it MBCHB, they translated technical medical terms, anterior, superior, iliac spine into Africans and taught them medicine in Africans. When they qualified to increase the level of hope, they put them in real hospitals to treat real hosp patients. When you get it wrong, somebody dies a real death. Today, 27 years into democracy, the University of Forte and Terflop are still the poorest. The formerly white universities are the ones that are still getting most of the funding. Even the ones that has produced five African presidents neglected, you see by the grass, just in the pavement when you approach it. So I think we have not succeeded in shaping these institutions of higher learning into our own image. The book of Revelation says, where there is no vision, the people perish. We lack that strategic vision. A personal family story. And it was a disaster to close down those uh, uh, Ambach trade schools. You know, and I'm telling this story all the time. My brother who comes after me, his name is Sipo Khadene. Uh, because I was more academic, so I went to pass my metric, I went to university. So they forced him also to say, hey, Follow your brother, you must also go to university, you must go, you must pass your metric. And 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 the this young man was struggling and it's definitely difficult. In fact, he became very rebellious. And all it's all to my mind. So he redirected that entire energy to become a, a real source, and we thought he's a lost cause. And there was a man, I call him an, a, a wise uncle, who said, No, 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 to university. He took him to score metals and he was taught feta and tena, which is a trade there. And he went to Modern to qualify there. And he was a feta and tena for about 15 to 20 years at, the, at that time. And I said, challenged him, I said, man, you're coming from a stock of business people. Now you've got enough experience to start your own business. Right now, he's got his own factory, he's got his own company, he's employing people, he's living a good life, and he's making a success of his life. Much more than he would ever even done if he had finished his degree. He's actually been employing people with degrees. That is what we're talking about. We, that, that was a cardinal educational error that we made. And we closed, you remember the Nessus Colleges? that we used to be there, that gave people an opportunity to, to learn. I think somehow, somewhere, we need to wake up and, 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 and do something about that. I have a, thank you very much. We have a question from Judy Lamini. I assume it's Dr. Judy Lamini, but... Uh, oh, yeah, um, you're <laughs> and, 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 and listen, listen to the question. Uh, you, you'll realize. <laughs> so you're, uh, it says, GBF has gone up. This is gender-based violence. Mental well-being is really important. Professor Mohale. That's the message. <laughs> <laughs> so because Mrs. Judy is our boss at VETS, and she comes to the VETS Foundation meetings and sits there the whole day, by the way. But also my business partner, because when we started Drake and Skull Integrated Facilities Management, and we got the first public-private partnership under healthcare um, uh, at Inkosal Belutul Central Hospital. We gave her a first contract to form Begani, and I worked with her, an accomplished uh, business person, uh, an academic of note, an author of a best-selling book, Equal, um, uh, and, 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 and I attended the launch, and we are blessed to have her. But, but here's my response to her question, but at a high level. Because gender-based violence and mental health, we, we have touched a little bit on it, and I think she's agreeing with us. I think as Africans, if we forget to understand why we are where we are today, we will never be able to come out of this morass. The English gave South Africa to the Africaners 
not to the black elites, primarily for three reasons. Even though the black elites were more educated than the, the, the Africaners, and indeed, they were better farmers. One was, they need to continue to give us a crucible of cheap labor for our mines. Number two, was the output of these mines, gold, but in particular, the diamonds, must be sold to us as Britain. Three, not South Africa, but London will determine the price. Hence, the London Sales Organization. That's why when the Africaners got into power, the first thing that they did was to create honest support, to learn about farming and veterinary science. And after the University of Pretoria, the rest is history. Today, we have not changed that math as the people who are in political office, but not in economic office. Poverty still has primarily a black and feminine face. And if you are born in Alexander, the chances are you are already condemned to be in an informal settlement. You are born white and in Bryanston, the chances are you will be a blue collar worker and you are going to live quite a comfortable life. Today I pay more per hour to my plumber than to the cardiothoracic surgeon. Thank you, sir. No, that's very true. Um, in fact, uh, a friend of mine in the UK said exactly the same thing. Um, his neighbor is an accountant, and he said uh, his neighbor had a, a boiler problem, and a plumber came. And when they gave him the invoice, he realized the plumber is earning more than he does. Um, and <laughs> he's. Like, sorry, yes. sorry, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add on what the uh, Chancellor asked the question. Is, you know, last year a student was m murdered by her husband, not husband, ex boyfriend, apologies, in um, Lalini, somewhere in the Eastern Cape uh, during lockdown, right? I think then maybe she had, of course, moved on and became a student. The first year BSc or second year BSc student in, jo in Johannesburg left, that, left the boy behind. You know, men getting left behind become angry. Uh, and the guy maybe thought, I mean, that was, and as the SSC president then, the young man, said, you know, I'm calling you brothers. We did it. Right? Until we need to take ownership. Leadership is about taking ownership. You know, like a, almost a typical Roman general falling a sword. Metaphorically, they say, we own this. We need this, the, if you don't own it as men, uh, then you're not going to solve it. It is us who are perpetrators. And I think that's what this young man said. So I think at some stage, an element of ownership, changing the race culture, adversities from the old macho culture of men's race into a culture of what it is to educate a 21st century man. That is uh, very, very important. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lamine, for raising GBV because it's a very important, um, including femicide, of course. It's a very important part of leadership and what we are discussing here. Teddy Ramabulana, how do we ensure that former black universities upscale to uh, UCT or VETS level without leaving them behind as the um, uh, caterer or for working class in particular. I think we've dealt with that. So if he's been following, thank you, Teddy. You, you got the answer before the question. And then Mbulelo um, Meiwa, question to Ntate Mohale. Why, with your rich experience in business management, you did not choose to support our state-owned business by making yourself available for at least five years to be CEO of an SOE. Bafunu tenderish at that. So the truth be told, so first of all, you know, when we have strategic conversations with people that we mentor, we ask five questions that they must answer. It's not about right or wrong, it's the lens through which you look at life. We say, what's your purpose? Where do you want to play? How do you play to win? What skills do you need? And who's going to help you? So I've chosen to be a business person, not a politician, not a consultant, not to run my own B entity, but to touch people in corporate. So I'm a corporate entity. It's a choice that I've made. However, 
Remember, I became MD of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company in 1996, OTS Elevators. At that time, it was part of United Technologies Corporations out of Hartford, Connecticut. OTS made lifts, Carrier made air conditioners, Sikorsky, they made helicopters. We sold one, the Black Hawk, to Charles Taylor. We had a Hamilton Sunstrand, they made environmental products, toilets for the space shuttle, a cabin for Apollo 13, etc. Pratt and Whitney, they made jet engines, PW300, PW800s, especially on the Boeing 747s. And at that time, the Minister of Public Enterprises, Jeff Harden, had hunted me from Otis to go and become the first South African Executive Vice President at SAA, an eight-year-old award-winning African airline. And I went there to become an Executive Vice President and looking after three portfolios, revenue management, global sales, and strategic alliances. And not only that, I served on the board of AXA, and I was on the board of South African Express Airways. So I've paid a little bit of my rent. But what you realize very quickly because of this cadre deployment is that instead of picking the best amongst us, who can use the more than 740 state-owned enterprises and state-owned companies to push this country forward in time and in space, no, we give it to people who must go and be CEOs there, more often than not, who don't even know the difference between income and cash. Because they've agreed that 5% of their salary will go to the organization. So we are killing ourselves because we are really not moving forward. Here's my last thought. Had we put women and black people in the more than 740 SOEs in the 27 years that we've been in charge, and we make provision for 20% of them failing just for a period of five years, because that's what the question is saying. Today we'll be sitting with 3,000 black and women managers with a demonstrable track record. This ANC-led government has killed more black professionals and more black small businesses than the whole of apartheid put together. And you can do the math. In one day at ESCOM, there's 20 black CEOs that on average have been there each 27 years. Four of them were there only for six months, including Tidiso Madonna. After six months, four of them were fired because they refused to sign the optimum coal contract to the, to the Guptas. Each one of them had spent in corporate 20 years. So the way state capture works, it's really just on those four things. One, it's creating a shadow state. Two, it's repurposing SOEs and SOCs. Number three, getting rid of the good guys and replacing them with the bad guys. Their only claim to fame is that they must aid and abet state capture. In fact, we had a name for them. We called them clever blacks. And then lastly, it's now you must go to the hose pipe, drink from the fountain, and capture national treasure because we run the biggest asset manager in the continent, the PIC, on behalf of the GEPF, sitting on two trillion asset under management. So it is quite attractive to go. So I think the day our politicians wake up and say, let's put our best foot forward, I tell you, Africa is not a poor continent, just poorly governed. Over to you, sir. Um, I've got a comment here from Tumi uh, Sikete or Sikete. How are you ensuring all of this wealth of wisdom and knowledge you have shared with us is captured and converted into literature for the benefit of future generations across the continent? Now, to me, uh, to me you are very uh, ambitious. Uh, we've just been sitting here for nearly two hours. You want us to write a book. <laughs> but it's, it's special. Yes, go ahead. First of all, we're capturing it. This was Right now on, on, on video, that's the reason why we didn't want to make it a Zoom or a, a Teams meeting because uh, then you don't have the, the replay value. So as ULP, we have deliberately have these kind of sessions like this. Even during the COVID, that's why you don't have. If it was uh, uh, pre-COVID, this place would be packed with over maybe 200 people sitting around this. So we've captured it. And we've, we've deliberated about that. And... Uh, 
uh, there is a secondly we've launched a program last week which is called uh, ULP Authors Forum uh, which is encouraging the whole culture of writing if you think about it I mean oh, more than thousand years ago Africa was modern civilization was here but because we had no culture of writing with oral culture we lost that whole civilization I mean Egypt is in Africa if you think about it and 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 so what we're talking about is now have this culture of writing so we'll also be right developing classes of authors Bonang will be inviting him to get a young student, a young young man called confidence he is actually passionate uh, interviewing writers so we will be documenting this we we're planning to have a, a, a series of documenting uh, all the material that we have with huge amount of data I mean uh, ELP has been 10 years now Theo how many uh, CEOs have been here 86 CEOs we've got captured and it's one book after the other that is going to come out of here so we are capturing it that's for sure and I have a few comments if I may yeah Mary Villagazi. <laughs> Tender premiership. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But 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 listen to the comment. Listen to the comments. It's quite, it's quite it's quite interesting. Inspired by the discussions this evening, brownie points. Thank you for hosting. I look forward to a similar session with women from the east. <laughs> Is there something special in Katlehong, water or air, by the way? <laughs> uh, and then um, I've got Noziswe uh, Dinga. Do you think the quality of our education system can ever produce such quality leadership to take our country forward? Secondly, are we producing graduates or entrepreneurs who will think out of the box that was sort of mentioned thank you very much Nozizwe very uh, much uh, futuristic there you predicted that one and then um, uh, Dr. Lamini comes back says yes Vilagazi well articulated men's accountability and deliberate change of culture is part of the solution to, er to eradicate GBVF and then um, I've got here, so this is, this is good. We've got a lot of people uh, taking part now uh, online. Uh, Ray Villagazi, proud of you guys. Nelson uh, Lipoko, Pepos, well said, Maurice. Uh, Mudise Setwaba, we read one from him. K1, rise up, black child, wise up. Um, we have uh, Musa Shangase, a candle loses nothing to give light to another, amazing. Um, if you continue on that path, we're going to change the world. So um, uh, those are the uh, comments. They were not necessarily uh, questions. But um, do you have any uh, thoughts on any of those? Before, before I ask you to make your closing comments. I should also comment on the statement by Mary Villagas. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I will promise Mary that uh, we will definitely uh, yes. through ULP uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll charge the CEO to find uh, uh, women uh, from, the, from the east or from the west uh, who grew up in the township and have a situation uh, a, a, a session like this we will definitely I want to say to Mary Mary uh, you are so right you know, uh, we are feminists here. So I know nowadays they talk about Instagram, Twitter, optics are everything. Uh, when you see males sitting like this in the 21st century, it doesn't really look right. Yeah. But it's because we have a bigger plan. Yeah. This is the beginning. Yeah. We end with the women. So it's not where you start, Mary. <laughs> okay, yeah. Let me add on what Dr. Judy Lamin has said. You know, many people are worried that their daughters are going to be victims of gender-based violence and femicide. But very few are really concerned about the fact that their sons are the ones that are doing the harming. Therefore, to add on what Brazeblon has said, we need to find a way of raising men 
and liberate them to take them out of the man cave and to be comfortable that there's a new way of masculinity that is not toxic, that is not misogynistic, that you don't find your joy, purpose, and meaning by thinking that being head of the family is actually giving people instructions when actually what it means is to serve the same way that Christ says, I'm the head of the church, to serve. Thank you very much. Um, did I read Soraya Thomas? Many leaders started their leadership journey at a child labor age <laughs> and not higher education facility. They're just reminding you. Um, how, do you, how do we take this to secondary and primary school level? We need to ingrain this way of thinking. You've already touched on it when we're talking about vocational training and so on. So thank you very much, Soraya. Uh, ten points for uh, being on the button. So we've come to uh, the end of our uh, discussion. And uh, I want to offer you a bit of time to give us your closing thoughts. I didn't want to say remarks. It sounds like I'm at a, a wedding as a lokshin. Uh, uh, so far, I'm closing remarks. Uh, uh, we are at ULP here. So uh, could you be uh, generous enough to give us uh, over what you've given us tonight? your closing thoughts about where we need to go with uh, leadership in uh, South Africa and indeed on the continent because we are inherently African, so we are not an island. Um, can I start with you, Bob Um I'll start on an optimistic note. I think this has been a very deep com conversation. Frankly, I'm, this is a world economic level. World Economic WEF Forum. I mean, I, I'm sure that not even Professor Schwab can do your job. <laughs> First, I mean, congratulations. I think you really have provoked us, skewered us, uh, roasted us, and <laughs> with a, a devilish smile, you know? But, um, but thank you so much, uh, Bob Ngoz. Uh, and uh, I mean, to be this, with this panel to me has been so humbling. Uh, people are well, my elders, actually, whom I hold in extremely high regard, and the remarks that come from some of the seniors of society here. To close is, I'll not summarize because I think a lot has been said, but I think I'm going to leave with this parting shot that it's about the ripples of hope. You know? We are daunted by all that surrounds us, but it just takes like a candle. Each, each, and, each and every ripple will aggregate into the waves that will wash away all this that surrounds us. Steve Bugos said that as a young 27-year-old, 28-year-old man, I can see beyond the horizon, right, a shimmering prize that will bestow upon the world, that of the African face of humanity, right? My view is despite all these vicissitudes are going through, right, they will shape and mold us. Scandinavians came from the jungles as Viking, marauding Vikings and rapists and became the most progressive men of the 21st century, right? What I'm saying is, I do see a future as a nuclear physicist so bright, it's so brighter than a thousand atomic bombs smashing together, and it'll, it'll come from the east. <laughs> I'm sure Jeff is very proud of you. Probably listening, yeah. Your principal in Fumana. <laughs> Jeff, thank you. <laughs> Um, to the nuclear physicist, 10 points for poetry, please. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, so it's not by accident that we chose to be in education because when one steadily burns the midnight oil, one gains access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom, the world of meaning, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. Even though we are in academia, we want to teach our colleagues, friends, and significant relationships 
to start their own businesses and employ our own children. Because I think it's madness that we continue to make babies and send them to a different neighborhood to go on their knees and ask somebody else for a job. Lastly, for me, it has been truly fantastic to be in the presence of dignified greatness from the black pool of excellence. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yes, Bob Khatia. Also, thank, thank you. Uh, this is a great uh, session we've had. Thank you for the wise men from the East. Thank you, Milton, for doing such a great job uh, in facilitating this job. I just want to speak. Is the camera there? I want to. I want to I speak to a young man or a young girl in Katlehong, in Soweto, in Tembisa, and you're sitting there. The only dream is that you will live and die in, in, in that township, and uh, you, your vision is so limited, uh, and you, 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 you think you, you, your whole sky is already blocked, and uh, you're from a poor family, maybe you came up from a very dysfunctional family, maybe you came up from a, in a situation where there is no education, there's nobody in your family has ever passed metric. I want to tell you something, that you are the one who's going to start breaking through the cycle of poverty out of your family. You have a potential to make that giant leap out of your own family. You. We need you. This whole world is waiting for you. And please, your talents will outstrip any township life that you have. And never limit yourself. Rise up. The reason we are here, we are here just to inspire you, to cheer you, to encourage you, to equip you, to make sure that you become the best that you can be. And the whole world is waiting for you. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us. Yes. Well, that brings us to uh, the end of the panel discussion. Thank you so much for taking my questions. I have my own little uh, close. Uh, you know, when we started, I quoted Oscar Wilde, who I followed uh, quite uh, uh, enthusiastically as a young man in Orlando West, uh, dreaming big, trying to dream beyond the township, and. Um, when you quoted Steve Biko, you uh, reminded me. Oscar Wilde says, uh, a dreamer is one who can only find his way by moonlight. His punishment is that he sees the dawn before the rest of the world. And that's on my father's grave. Uh, you can take it over, CEO. Thank you. Thank you, Bramelt. And on your grave, I will write the one that interviewed Tutuzani Zuma. Uh, but this is the first time in, in more than 11 years that I speak after Babu Khattab. And uh, the reason, his speech, is the reason that I never want to speak uh, after him. But let me thank the panelists today. Let me thank you, Babu Khattab, as well, and Mam Khattab, and for the, for the investment that you have made into ULP and all of this institution. Uh, you know, every time we email you, we emailed you, and I think within five minutes you told your PA, confirm this one. And I was thinking, you know, we've called you so many times since 2000, uh, 2014. You've been here, I think, five times now, and we really appreciate your support. Uh, Mr. Villagazi, this is the start of a new journey for you with us at ULP, and I appreciate it. And we thank you for joining us today. And we wish you all the best as you lead one of the, the biggest institution on the continent. And we think you'll do great. Um, it's funny that in uh, 2017, myself and Babu Khadr were in a room with you and you were signing uh, a bit of a contribution from Cheetah. And at the time, you were a deputy VC. And we could have never told that you are going to be a VC. And uh, look at you today. And look at Babu Khadr today. You know? And Tatum uh, Halu was right on that, uh, on that, um, on that money that uh, the business school must go after. I, I always tell him that Tatum Halu thinks I likes money, but uh, you told him today. And you, <laughs> <laughs> from Milton, my friend, what can I say? My brother, my mentor, my sounding board. You know, um, I asked him on Sunday to do this, 
And uh, within five minutes, he came back and he said, whatever you want me to do, my brother, I'll be there. And he even cut his hair. He looked like you, Professor, when I was yesterday. <laughs> and look at how handsome he is today. <laughs> to everyone who's joined us, please do follow our um, YouTube page. It seems like we want to be using it more than our Facebook page going forward. Can you please also go to urpgovernance.co.za to see some of the programs we're doing there? If you can also go to mmi-sa.com, mmi-sa.com, you'll see a nine-month program that we have there, and I think it will help you. And I think the last thing is that next month we continue with our Authors Forum. We've got Mr. Mtetonyati, and he will be the one who will be joining us uh, as the, at, at our first live event next month, and then we'll announce the next speaker in the next few weeks. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. And thank you again for joining your PP World. Bye-bye. Today, we are gathered here to celebrate the graduates of MMI and ULP governance. So this is a wonderful uh, celebration service we're going to have. You're now a graduate. You need to have a vision. You have now finished, and it is a message that you write down the vision. You know why I want you to write a vision? It's because I believe in vision. When we dreamt MMI, when we dreamt ULP, and uh, when we dream ULP governance, you just you write it down and people come and look at where now we are. Through programs such as these, we are attempting to grow what we consider to be great leaders. Part of being a great leader is adherence to sound corporate governance in pursuit of ethical leadership. Because you can have it all and know it all without at the core, sound values and ethics, you're done. And sometimes as a marketplace minister, we attach ourselves to all of the things around us that can anchor us. But God wants to remind you, your strength alone lies in me. The second one it says, is in the next verse it says, whose heart is on pilgrimage. And always as a marketplace minister, you would have sometimes where you would be challenged and you would go to some lonely patches even though the success comes on the other side. But when your heart is on pilgrimage, no matter what comes your way, a thousand will fall on this side and a ten thousand will fall on this side. But God says that the steadfast love of what I have for you will always make sure that if you have your heart set on pilgrimage, you will make sure that this valley that you go through will become stronger on the other side. I've always had ideas but never knew how to start. And with this program, I learned where to start, like a business plan. We're always afraid of tackling a business plan, but now I can understand the whole concept of actually building a business, not just a business plan, acquiring funding and getting capital, even on your own side. The valuable lessons was uh, how you really sacrifice and how you, 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 you become somebody with integrity. When we say integrity, it is what eventually should guide your, your, your conscience. I think that is what I, what I take out of this program. Every finish line is the beginning of a new race. So today marks the finish line of the course that you attended, but it is, it is the beginning of a new race. Amen.